Good afternoon. My name is Pamela Rogers, and I'm a member of the Arizona Library Association Professional Development Committee. I will be your moderator for today's webinar. The Arizona Professional Development Committee provides enhanced professional development opportunities for members to increase the knowledge, skills, and abilities of library and information professionals across the state of Arizona. Before we get started, please note a few housekeeping details. Webinar participants are in listen-only mode. Please post your questions anytime during the presentation in the chat at the bottom of your screen. You can turn on live transcript and choose show subtitles in your Zoom window for closed captioning. This session is being recorded and the recording will be made available on the library, Arizona Library Association YouTube channel. A link will be provided in your follow-up email. Lauren Clementina will be your technical director today. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you can contact her via the chat. If you are unable to hear sound during the webinar, you may dial in using the phone number provided in your registration confirmation email. At the end of the webinar, we ask that you complete a simple evaluation survey. The estimated time to complete the survey is two to three minutes. Please take the time to complete it as we use the data to improve our offerings to you and your feedback is important to us. I'd like to encourage library staff of all levels to consider becoming an Arizona Library Association member. Among other things, your membership enables AZLA to provide professional development opportunities to library staff across Arizona. Visit azla.org for more information. Please support AZLA. When you add our organization as your designated charity and purchase through the Amazon Smile portal, Amazon will donate 5% of your eligible purchases made to the Arizona Library Association. And the Professional Development Committee wants you. If you have expertise in library science that you think would help other libraries and librarians, please consider applying to be a webinar presenter. You will find a link in your webinar follow-up email. And I want to invite you to the next program in our monthly webinar series, brought to you by the Arizona Library Association Professional Development Committee. On December 8th, join us for library advocacy from A to Z, what to expect during this year's legislative session with Erin McFarland and Jessica Rainbow. In 2022, states across the country enacted legislation meant to censor and restrict library services and the right to access information. In Arizona, Governor Ducey signed HB 2439 into law, which requires school libraries to post all titles purchased for the collection for 60 days after approval. Join Erin McFarland and Jessica Rainbow to learn more about what to expect for the 2023 legislative session and how you can help advocate for the freedom to read. Registration for this webinar is posted to the Arizona Library Association calendar, advertised in the monthly professional development email blast, and a link will be provided in your webinar follow-up email. And now I would like to thank you all for attending today. Please welcome Mary Beth Reedner and Tammy Hurst for their presentation, Don't Forget Your Patrons with Memory Loss. Thank you. I'm going to um, pull up our presentation, I hope, um, and we'll be ready to go. All righty. Um, I'm Mary Beth Reidner, and I'd like to thank you, Pam, um, for that nice introduction and lead in. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is that um, all of these slides will be available to you um, as a handout. I guess that will come out with your follow-up email. So all the links you'll find on our screen will also be live on that handout. So <clears throat> to get started, the number of people living with dementia is large and continues to grow. 
The Alzheimer's Association estimates that there are over 6.5 million people in the US today living with Alzheimer's. And here in Arizona, this number is over 150,000 and is projected to grow by one third to over 200,000 by 2025. And that's only two years away. And these are just the diagnosed cases. It's been reported that nearly 50% of all dementias go undiagnosed. In addition to today, there are more than 15 million American family members and friends who provide unpaid care to this population. So what's a brief definition of dementia? The Alzheimer's Association defines it as an umbrella term describing a variety of diseases and conditions that develop when nerve cells in the brain called neurons die or no longer function normally. And the death or malfunction of neurons causes changes in one's memory, behavior, language, and ability to think clearly. While 60 to 80% of those living with dementia have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease with traditional short-term memory loss, there are many other types of dementia, including vascular dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, and frontotemporal degeneration, or FTD which was my husband's disease. Also a significant number of people are being diagnosed with young onset dementia as early as their 40s and 50s. Dementia is a progressive disease that moves through several stages commonly designated as early, middle and late or mild, moderate and severe. Frequently people are not even diagnosed until they have entered the middle stage. Progression of dementia can be fairly fast or last up to two decades. Each person's abilities are affected differently and at their own individual pace. There are tremendous amounts of variation. So it's safe to say that when you have met one person with dementia, you have met one person with dementia. A report on the living arrangements of people living with um, Alzheimer's disease and related dementias was published in 2017, and it indicates that 81% of the people living with dementia are still living at home in the community, with only 19% living in residential care facilities or nursing homes. This has great implications for libraries, as many of these people are still walking into our buildings. I was honored to be my late husband, Steve's caregiver through a 10 year journey with a rare young onset dementia called primary progressive aphasia, a form of FTD. It's through what we experienced together that I learned how much people living with dementia want to retain their identity, dignity, and independence despite the inevitable progress of the disease. When I retired in 2008, I started offering a book and reading program, which I called Tales and Travel, as a volunteer in a local memory care facility. The program takes people living with dementia on imaginary trips to locations across the US and the globe using library materials. In 2011, I began partnering with the Gail Borden Public Library in Elgin, Illinois, and the program has expanded over the years with grants, awards, a number of conference presentations, journal articles, and book chapters. There is a Tales and Travel website that provides librarians and others with a free toolkit to replicate the program and to adapt for their own communities. It includes a video of the program in action, as well as 12 excursion guides and folk tales from 31 destinations made freely available through a Creative Commons license. As I was developing Tales and Travel, I was inspired by the guidelines for library services to persons with dementia developed by the International Federation of Library Associations, or IFLA, back in 2007. These guidelines were based on the efforts of librarians in the Netherlands and the United Kingdom, who early on advocated for use of books and reading with this population. These guidelines are still relevant today. Tales and Travel is not a passive program. It was designed from the beginning to get participants actively involved in the sessions in a way similar to art and music therapists who use their specialties to engage those living with dementia. 
librarians can use literacy activities as a vehicle to encourage active participation. We know that it's helpful to engage all of our senses when we're participating in a cognitive activity. And a book is a terrific manipulative that stimulates memories and prompts conversation. After showing them the destination on a globe or large map, we invite them to take turns reading out loud from a folktale, legend, or myth associated with the chosen location. We retype the story in large font to make it easier to read and to maintain their dignity. Most can still read and do so with gusto. Those who don't choose to read aloud follow along with the printed text or listen quietly. We also share five interesting facts with them, again, inviting them to read them out loud. We often hear comments such as, I didn't know that, or isn't that amazing? We then distribute books carefully selected from both the adult and children's collections for them to browse through. The most important criteria is that the books be richly illustrated with color photographs. Over the years, I have also been inspired by the emerging concept of person-centered care. The Alzheimer's Society in the United Kingdom offers these five points to explain this approach. Especially significant here is the second bullet about understanding what makes them unique. And also the last one about ensuring that they have chances to try new things or take part in activities that they enjoy, like reading and going to the library. One commonly held stigmatizing stereotype is that people living with dementia cannot read. But research actually shows just the opposite. Michelle S. Bourgeois, a professor at the University of South Florida, stated in a 2010 New York Times article that all my research demonstrates that people who were literate maintain their ability to read until the end stages of dementia. The Claridge article written in 2018 points out the stigma that even family caregivers often hold, sometimes saying, oh, since they cannot remember what a book is about, there's no longer any point in giving them books to read. But Claridge, however, says that the reading process itself may be beneficial to counteract loneliness, lack of self-worth, and boredom. Bourgeois conducted another study with Jeanette Benegas, published in 2011. Study findings indicate that reading and comprehension were enhanced when the reading material was more relevant to the person's interests and experiences. And this jives nicely with that second tenet of the person-centered care approach that I just mentioned about understanding what makes each person unique. We need to recognize that there may be a different purpose for reading after someone has been diagnosed with a form of dementia. Now, instead of reading a best-selling novel, they might enjoy browsing through a book on a favorite hobby or some other topic that is of particular interest to them. Literacy activities can stimulate memories and encourage social interactions and conversations. Participants can get a feeling of competence and well being from doing something that they have always enjoyed. At every session I conduct, I see people experience moments of joy at learning or relearning something new found in a book. It's important not to make assumptions based on prior beliefs. Facility staff and even family members are often surprised by the reading ability of participants. A simple invitation to read out loud often produces wonderful results. Don't mistake shyness for an inability to read. Browsing through nonfiction is another successful literacy activity. It's amazing to see them flipping through books on a wide variety of topics and talking with program staff and each other for 20 minutes at a time. There are many types of literacy materials that can be used successfully. Short fiction, such as folk tales, short stories, or excerpts from classic fiction can all be used for oral reading. Nonfiction books, richly illustrated with color photographs, can be selected from both the adult and children's collection for browsing. I have found that the travel theme allows for a selection of a wide variety of topics, including geography, history, culture, sports, music, art and architecture, and cooking. Local history is another popular topic and gets participants remembering and eagerly talking. 
Gary Glazner of the Alzheimer's Poetry Project advocates for choral reading of poetry, along with what he calls the call and response method. Typing out the lyrics to songs in a large font makes it easy for participants to sing the whole song, not just the chorus. Word games are another way to engage participants in a literacy activity. In Tales and Travel, I incorporate both folk tales and nonfiction. Let me remind you again that 31 folk tales are freely available on the Tales and Travel website for anyone to use. Going back to the Benegas and Bourgeois study from 2011, they found that reading comprehension was enhanced when people were offered more personally relevant information. Person-centered care also suggests treating those living with dementia as unique individuals with their own history, experiences, and interests. I remember visiting a library in rural downstate Illinois where the librarians had pulled a number of books on training your horse for a program at a local memory care facility. That topic was chosen because many of the residents had raised horses in the past. Local history programs also bring back memories and stimulate conversation. One librarian in Springfield, Missouri told me about a program she did on a local chocolate factory that was a great success, especially when they passed around candy to sample. Since person-centered care advocates for being aware of each person's unique interests, hobbies, and life experiences, I thought I would share with you some of my husband's interests, which included motorcycles, the Old West, home improvement, and the Vietnam War as he was a veteran. Not the typical fare that comes to mind when talking about someone living with dementia. Format also matters. Increased white space, larger font, and relevant photographs have all been found to facilitate reading among people living with dementia. Several small independent publishers of books for this population have incorporated these format suggestions into their materials. These are perfectly fine books to use and purchase, but they appear to me to be designed for those in the late stages of their disease process and have rather limited subject content. Many nonfiction children's books already incorporate these same design elements. Before I turn the program over to Tammy, I'd like to say something about using books from the children's or juvenile collection with people living with dementia. The IFLA guidelines and my own experience indicate that selected children's books can be appropriate. When I'm talking about children's books, I'm referring to nonfiction books written for about grades three through eight. I'm not referring to children's fiction, especially picture books or beginning readers. As a former children's librarian, I have great respect for children's nonfiction publishers to whom we entrust our children's educations and whose books fill at least half the shelves of our children's departments. These collections can be mined to find appropriate books on almost any subject. And my 14 years of experience demonstrates that they are readily accepted by people living with dementia. It may be time to enlist the aid of your children's librarians in this selection process. It's the very simplicity of children's books that make them so appropriate. And there is already a whole treasure trove of materials ready at your fingertips. We also need to always remember that to preserve the dignity of these adult users. So now I'm gonna turn things over to Tammy who has a lot of tips based on her experience as well. Thank you, Mary Beth. Um, my name is Tammy and I'm working with the Olathe Public Library. And I know Beth, uh, Mary Beth mentioned uh, Tales and Travel Memories. Um, this one is what I would consider a TNT program, tried and true. One that always is well re uh, received and always enjoyed. Um, I, like she mentioned, it's very adaptable. Um, there's an infinite number of places you can go and an infinite number of aspects of the place that you can talk about, depending on the interest of your group. And there's a lot of sensory things that you can add, like food, art, uh, dancing, music, tasting, smelling, those kinds of things. So highly recommend if you haven't tried Tales and Travel Memories, um, this one continues to be a very uh, popular program for us. Next, please. 
And a fairly important part of the program is to leave time at the end for your participants to page through books on their own or with uh, other volunteers that are with you. Uh, there's a, a temptation to make it into a learning session where you're the teacher and they're the students and you're trying to get through material, but really the purpose of the program is to allow them to enjoy reading the books together or with the partner. And so uh, just make sure that you don't forget that part. Next, please. As Mary Beth mentioned, uh, things that we bring uh, for our programs include children's nonfiction books. Coffee table books work well, not for the text, but for the beautiful photography. Sometimes maps are applicable, and if we have them, we'll bring those. Next, please. Uh, some other advantages of using children's books, uh, they tend to be lightweight, so it's easier to hold. There's less text and more pictures. Um, they can often be found with uh, larger fonts automatically. And uh, they're designed by the authors to be simplified in the sentence structure. So all of those things are reasons to use children's books. Next, please. Uh, a few things to consider, though, when you're selecting the children's books, uh, you are dealing with adults, and they want to be treated like adults. They know they're adults, and they don't want to be uh, spoken down to or treated like children. And so uh, one thing that I do when I'm trying to select books is that I read a little bit from the book out loud and see what it sounds like. If it sounds conversational, then it's okay. But if it sounds like an easy reader, like a first grader learning how to read with short choppy sentences that sound stilted, then I would avoid them. Uh, here's a couple of examples of things that may be a little too simple. I mean, you do have to consider your audience and what stage of the disease they're in. But the second one, listen to how it sounds. The coffee is served in a metal pot with a long neck. It's thick and rich, yum. See, that would be perfect for a first grader, but uh, someone living with dementia would uh, probably be turned off by that. Next, please. Another thing that uh, we've noticed is that it's very helpful to not have as much going on on the pages. These children's books are designed to attract the attention of the young kids and hold them but sometimes they can have too much going on. For example, this page has multiple pictures, texts in different places. Something like this may be a little bit too much for someone with dementia, even though the pictures are realistic and the text is appropriate. Uh, I usually try to have books where there's just one bank of text and one picture. That seems to be a, a magic formula for us. Next, please. And uh, you wanna make sure that you look at the illustrations. All three of these books have some fabulous information that's accurate and uh, very interesting to our groups, but the pictures are what make them not appropriate. I myself love Sesame Street, but someone else might consider that a little too babyish and may be offended by it. So steer clear of anything that with cartoons or puppets or other childish images. Generally, I, I stick with um, full color uh, actual photographs. Go ahead. Uh, you might be tempted to use travel guides like these. Um, these books are designed to be small and compact so that you could pack them in a purse or a, a suitcase while you travel. And that's exactly what makes them inappropriate for the group that we're dealing with. Um, the text is just simply too small to make it readable. The, uh, the language is appropriate, the pictures are appropriate, but the text is just too small. So generally I avoid uh, travel guides. Go ahead. 
And even though we love tales and travels, you don't have to just do travel programs. And I'm gonna share a couple of ideas of things that we've done and had success with that kind of go in line with this, giving these uh, groups a reading experience. Uh, some pop possible topics are trivia. Find some trivia that is on a topic of uh, interest to your group, type them up on uh, little cards and let them take turns reading the cards and asking trivia questions and answering them as a group. Local history is another good one. Chances are very good that people in the group have been to the sites that you are talking about. They're familiar, they have memories to share and familiarity is something you want. Uh, seasons are another topic that you could talk about. And we'll discuss that in just a minute when we talk about poetry. Go ahead. One thing that you can do is find just a single newspaper or magazine article, retype it in large print or blow it up on your copy machine and discuss it. Uh, you can read it out loud to the group. Uh, if there's someone who are several who might want to take turns reading, you can do it that way. I've even uh, color coded with highlighters of different paragraphs. And so I'll say, hey, could you read the blue paragraph? And could you read the pink one? It makes it just a little bit less intimidating for those who uh, will agree to read. This particular one was a good one because it talks about the opening day of baseball and why baseball is an American tradition and how baseball, the opening day symbolizes a switch from the dark cold winters to the warm uh, summers. And so this one in particular was a, a great one to discuss. Hey, what's your favorite baseball team? What memories do you have of going out to the ballpark? That sort of thing. So one thing you can do is find a newspaper or a magazine article and discuss it together. Go ahead. We mentioned local history. Chances are very good that local history sites in your area already have information on their websites or in their gift shop about the place. So you're not having to, you're not having to rewrite anything. All you need to do is get permission to copy it down or summarize it, type it out, and then read it together. This is a picture from the Mahaffey Farmstead and Stagecoach stop here in Olathe that most of our participants have been to or heard of. And so it, it lends itself very easily to topics like farming, uh, taking care of animals, other kinds of things that you might do on a farm. So this one was a good topic for us because it's something familiar. Um, next, please. Uh, Mary Beth mentioned uh, using music lyrics as reading material. It's not a book, but it's still reading. And as she mentioned, uh, if they have the lyrics, they're more likely to participate fully in singing the songs. Uh, we like this particular series of DVDs, Sing Along with Suzy Q, but there are others. You can find them on YouTube easily. Uh, she actually has a website where you can go online and print the lyrics to her songs that are on her uh, CD or DVDs. And um, so it's just click and print, and then you have your lyrics all ready to go. She sings her songs a little bit slower pace, a little bit uh, lower tones that are easier to hear and to sing along with. And so you can do this with any topic, Christmas, Valentine's, 4th of July, a 1950s theme, anything like that. Um, Printed lyrics to songs and adding that musical piece in is very, very effective. Next, please. This was a fun one that we did uh, in Christmas time. Uh, I went through uh, some old newspapers and found letters to Santa that used to be, uh, used to be that you could uh, send in your letters to Santa and they would print them. And some of these were just adorable to read. So I found one for each person to read aloud. They were excited to see what the children were saying, what they asked for, and it led naturally to, to discussions about what was your favorite toy when you were little? What things did you ask Santa for? And so these are adorable. Um, you can find them in your local newspaper archives, uh, newspapers online if you have access to that. 
Here in uh, the Kansas City area, we have the Midwest Genealogy Center, and you can access newspapers.com from them for free with an e-card that's free to register and get online. Uh, there's also a Library of Congress has a site called Chronicling America, where they have digitized older newspapers that you can search for these kinds of things. Lots of fun activity. Next, please. Um, we mentioned uh, Gary Glasner and his Alzheimer's Poetry Project. I just recently learned about that and I have been so impressed with uh, what he is doing in terms of using poetry with people with Alzheimer's. And so we've begun to do a little bit of that. One thing I really like about uh, his programs is that he uses this call and response technique. And that's where you read a line and then have the group uh, recite it back to you. And you go line by line, reading the poem back and forth. I really like it because it uh, involves everybody at whatever stage they're at. And, and it gets the attention of everyone if everyone's uh, reading together, but they're not, no one's singled out as having to read by themselves, but everyone's experiencing the rhythm of the poetry, the language, the rhyming, all those kind of things. I generally look for poems that have a lot of sensory things in there. They talk about the colors and sounds and smells because those things lead to good discussions. And this particular activity we did was I found poems uh, around the theme of spring. And so we ended up talking about what does spring feel like? What does it sound like? What kinds of things do you see that in nature that tell you that it's springtime? So that was a really good thing. So highly recommend if poetry is your thing, look up Gary Glasner, G-L-A-Z-E-N-E-R. You can find him on YouTube and watch him in action or go to their website, the Alzheimer's Poetry Project and learn more. He's uh, got a couple of books about how his, uh, his methods, he also has a book published with all the poems that he uses. Next, please. And when in doubt, make up your own materials. It's not hard. Uh, we were, uh, we've been in the process of trying to write a couple of uh, grant requests to get some adaptive reading materials, but had been unsuccessful. So we decided to write our own. I found a book, a nonfiction adult book on a topic of, of interest. And it was, this one is about the history of ice cream. Talks about how it was uh, first made before the ice cream maker was invented. Uh, when it was brought to America, the how the rich uh, people made had their servants make ice cream, the invention of the ice cream maker, the invention of the uh, first ice cream sandwiches, the first uh, ice cream trucks that would go around in neighborhoods and sell ice cream. And so what I did was I just summarized several different topics that were discussed in the book into one or two paragraphs per page. Very, very large print. This is a 26 point print with a bold and a, a one and a half spaces in between. I put them into page protectors. I think that makes our arthritic hands, uh, they're easier to turn the pages. Put them in these binders, uh, half inch binders, and we made our own book. And we sat and read together. And it's, it was less intimidating to say, hey, would you read this page? and then have the next person read another page. And it didn't matter if you read the first page first and the last page second, because they're all about the same topic. So it led to some really good discussions, a good uh, sharing of memories. And of course, we ate ice cream together. So we had that sensory piece there, of tasting the sweetness and feeling the cold. So that's, this was a lot of fun. Uh, we did another one about chickens. Uh, we had several people in a group that had grown up on farms. So we did a book about chickens. And you would be surprised how many of them had memories about raising chickens, good and bad. So when, when in doubt, just uh, make your own books. Go ahead. So I'm going to turn this back to Mary Beth, but I, I hope that you will take the time to give some of these ideas a try. 
you know, this is really a trial and error kind of thing. If one thing works with the group, it may not work with the same group next time. So don't be afraid. Give it a try. One thing doesn't work, try something else. Um, this group of individuals that are, have dementia are so much fun to work with. They do have challenges, yes, but they're absolutely uh, delightful and um, very, very well deserving of our attention as librarians and programming professionals. So go ahead, Mary Beth, and uh, continue. Thanks, Tammy. <clears throat> Um, I'm so pleased with your enthusiasm and, and how you've just jumped in right there and, and taken over and tried different things. And there are no real um, best practices yet. We're just developing them. So uh, don't be afraid and, and just try something. And you'll, like, like she says, they just eat it all up. So um, thank you for those terrific and practical tips. Um, I'd like to tell you now about the only other reading program that I am aware of that focuses on people living with dementia. At the same time that I was experimenting with Tales and Travel, the reader organization in the United Kingdom in connection with the University of Liverpool began a study of their shared reading literature-based intervention. In the original 2013 study, short excerpts from fiction works or poems were read to a group of participants. The leaders then asked questions to stimulate discussion. Their study found that engagement in reading group activity appeared to produce a significant reduction in dementia symptom severity. And here are a few more studies on shared reading that were conducted in New Zealand and uh, even one in the United States in the state of Michigan. So how can librarians provide meaningful programs for the large number of people still living at home? Memory cafes are one answer. These are social gatherings for those living in the community who are usually in the early or middle stages of their disease process, often accompanied <clears throat> by a family member or care partner. These cafes serve as places to have fun, find support, and share experiences. People living with dementia often experience great social isolation, and memory cafes have been proven to help break that isolation. Libraries can be great places to host memory cafes, often in partnership with other community organizations. One such organization is Dementia Friendly America, which is a national initiative to engage all sectors of a community in supporting those living with dementia and their caregivers. There's a link here to the library sector guide. And uh, there are already eight dementia friendly communities in Arizona, as you can see listed here. If you want to find out more about memory cafes, here are two resources that you might find useful. The memory cafe directory identifies 11 memory cafes already in existence in Arizona, some who you may want to contact and develop a partnership with. The Percolator Memory Cafe Network in Massachusetts is becoming a nationwide leader in the field of memory cafes. Their website provides toolkits in both English and Spanish. And their archived quarterly meetings are terrific resources for anyone wanting to start a memory cafe. In 2017, I started bringing my Tales and Travel program once a month to two memory cafes in Arizona. These cafes met weekly, and before the pandemic, one of these cafes had a weekly attendance of 50 to 60 people, so there is great need. I used the basic Tales and Travel format that I outlined earlier, but as this was a longer program, I needed to add additional literacy activities. <clears throat> so I added things such as singing songs, using the printed lyrics, choral reading of poetry, word games, and adult coloring pages, because I'm not the artsy craftsy kind of person. <clears throat> During the pandemic, when cafes could not meet in person, some migrated to a virtual format. I converted Tales and Travel into an online format, which I now call Tales and Travel Adventures. I created content using photographs from my own travels, and I wrote simple narratives that people living with dementia are invited to read aloud themselves. There are now 11 adventures that are available both as YouTube videos and PowerPoint PDFs on the Tales and Travel website under the Memory Cafe tab. I'm using these adventures at one of the now revived in-person memory cafes, 
The participants still read out loud and browse through nonfiction books. And we continue singing, reading poetry, and using word games and adult coloring pages. It's really like a party and we have lots of fun. You may be asking if there are any additional resources to help train your staff on how to work with people living with dementia. Here is a link to a free National Network of Libraries of Medicine YouTube video. As you can see, uh, the objectives include understanding dementia, identifying the strengths and needs of people living with dementia, developing better communication techniques, and describing dementia-friendly uh, library practices. We'd also like to invite you to join our ALA interest group, um, which is called LSDA, Library Services for Dementia Alzheimer's. If you are already a member of ALA, there are no further dues to join. And if you are not a member of ALA, please feel free to join our Google group, LS4DA. These are really great ways to share experiences, ask questions, and meet like-minded colleagues. So what's next? We hope that we have given you some inspiration to experiment with offering book and reading activities to your patrons living with dementia. Best practices really are just now being created, so don't be intimidated. And this audience is so receptive and so hungry for cognitive engagement activities. We should never underestimate them. Instead, we should focus on their remaining strengths and not their losses. I would like to suggest that libraries might consider offering individual readers advisory appointments to people living with dementia and their care partners. LSDA is just starting to develop a questionnaire to help garner information that could be helpful in selecting books for individuals. This checklist might include things like their prior career, where they've lived or visited, major life events, and specifics such as hobbies or favorite sports teams. Using their responses, books could be pulled prior to their arrival so that they would not know where in the library they came from. I know that this is a, a very time intensive activity, but I think the results would be so worth it. Another way to use your time wisely is to develop partnerships with other local organizations that are already working with the same population, such as the dementia friendly communities in Arizona, um, the area agencies on aging are another local resource as our research hospitals. Finally, several libraries in the same geographic area might want to collaborate together to make the best use of everyone's time and energy. And really, your enthusiasm and creativity are the only limits. So thank you for your time and attention. I think it's time now for Q&A. Mary, Beth, and Tammy, that was wonderful. I mean, it's it just, Thank you so much for connecting with those with memory losses in your communities um, and, and just sharing how libraries can, can be such a valuable part of their lives. Um, questions that have come in, uh, we have one from Tamara who wanted to know if the Tales and Travels uh, as part of that program, are you reading to the attendees? And are they reading along? Like, how does that, what does that look like when you do that program? Or, or is the program a read aloud opportunities for participants or is there silent reading and so forth? I'll go first, maybe Tammy. Um, <clears throat> I've always made it uh, that the people who are participating actually participate. <laughs> so um, I take time when they come in to greet them, to meet them individually, to kind of break the ice a little bit. And then I, we show them on a map or a globe. So I'm talking to each individual as I go around the tables. Um, and so we kind of have a little bit of a rapport. And, and then when um, I say that this is your program, it's not mine, so you you have to do all the work. <laughs> and then I ask for the, one person to volunteer to read. And then after that, usually it's, it's very easy to get more people to read. And you know we, we are very patient with the people who read slower or read in a very quiet voice, you can barely hear them. But you know, everybody gets to do what they can do. And so they, they can shine in their own abilities. And that's how I approach it. Tammy? Uh, we do a, a group together at first, and then there's time at the end that they can read silently. Uh, when I do the reading, um, I always make it optional and tell them that this is not school. You don't have to raise your hand. You can pass if you don't want to. 
and um, we're not taking grades or pointing out mistakes. Just do the best you can. And uh, sometimes I get people that really don't want to read, and sometimes I get people that read with gusto. Uh, but I always make it a choice. Mm -hmm. Well, we Wonder do the browsing of, with books that's at your own pace. You know, you can start at the back of the book if you want. You can read if you want. You can just, you know, flip through a couple of pages. You can just have it sit in front of you. It's just an opportunity for them to do with it as they choose. Yeah, we try sounds... to involve them with questions, et cetera. Okay. Oh, yeah. It sounds like a real collaboration, um, you know, to really getting to know the, the, the folks that are, are there. That's, mm -hmm. that's wonderful. Um, how do you market, a uh, question from Kelsey, how do you market Tales and Travels um, or the other programs? So it's clear that there, that there are four persons with dementia or memory loss. Um, do you state it clearly, you know, when we're talking about just kind of respect and dignity? Um, how, how do you market these programs? Tammy, you want to take it first? Um, that is a little bit uh, important because uh, people normally, when they think of a travel program, they're thinking, oh, this is someone who's been to the country or grown up in the country, and they're sharing their slides of where they've been and telling those kinds of things. So I make sure that we say that this is a let's learn together kind of a program, um, that we're uh, reading together and learning together. So I make that clear that it's not a presentation so much as a let's learn together. And that's how I market it and, and try to explain it. But it is kind of different. And so it's a bit of a sell to explain what exactly you're wanting to do so that they're not um, expecting you to show up with all this knowledge. But the good thing about the program is you don't have to find somebody who has been to those places. Uh, you have the books right there in front of you. So if someone asks you a question you don't know the answer to, you can model, okay, I don't know the answer to that, but I bet we could find that in this book. Let's look in the book. And maybe you, if, depending on the question, you might say, when we're done with these uh, questions here, let's take a minute and look in the book and find the answer. Chances are really good that people in the group um, know the answer already. When we first started Tales and Travel, we brought it only to residential communities. And so we would make an appointment or phone call or whatever to the activity director at those locations. And then we'd come and show them a little bit more about what we intended to do. And I don't think we got turned down by anybody. They all wanted Never. a free program. <laughs> They're <laughs> desperate for to do. something, yeah. some kind of program. Yeah, so that, that was really quite easy. And then once they saw how well it went, they were, oh, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? So it's pretty an easy sell once you, you know, get in the door. And, and you just have to make some personal contacts if you can, you know. And um, if you're in a dementia-friendly community, there's already lots of networking happening. So you could, you know, um, rely on some of those connections. Um, your, your library newsletter, you just put something out. You know, it's kind of hard to get somebody to just walk in cold to a, a, a library program, but if your community is already doing a memory cafe or you go to an adult um, uh, daycare center or even some of the, um, I think the facilities would, would allow you to do something where you invited in people from outside because that's a marketing thing for them as well. So um, caregiver support groups, I mean, there's lots of avenues. But it's, it's takes some thought and some creativity. Um, that's wonderful. I think you just answered also Jennifer's question, which was about partnering with either local Alzheimer's associations mm -hmm. or nursing mm -hmm. homes or uh, care facilities that are that are around your library. Um, yeah, that that's wonderful to, to hear. That's really the connection that you're you're making is into those groups. Um, and, and also, Kelsey had asked, what was the name of the poetry program? And um, if you guys can just share that one more time, I believe that's the Alzheimer's Poetry Project. Am I, right. I have that right? And um, do you have a web that you can just search that? Is that Would that help find it? Uh, it's www.alz, that's A-L-Z, poetry.com. So it's right. allspoetry.com. Great. And you could probably just do a Google search for it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, have you, here's a question from Andrea. 
have you incorporated virtual reality uh, with the Tales and Travels or Memory Cafes? And you know what? I'm going to piggyback onto Andrea's because as I was listening to you since I podcast, I was really curious if you've used audio um, and, and audio stories um, in this because it, it, I, I think that would be interesting as well. Well, one of the things I did with my, uh, when I <clears throat> converted it to digital and it's, it's a YouTube video. So I read to them um, as, as we went through the slides, <clears throat> but I also suggested there was two ways to use it. They could just listen to me talk and they could follow along or they could turn down the volume and they could slow down, um, you know, pause things and just move to the next screen when they're ready and that, that they could read out loud themselves. So when I did do this virtually, that's what we did. Um, we use the PDF version and people would, would read in their homes <laughs> and we could share with four, five, six of us together. But, um, you know, there, there weren't huge groups during the pandemic, but yeah, so it, they are available and you could use them however you want. Honestly, I have no wanting to make any money or anything. Off of this. So it's just, a, and you know, people like, you know, Tammy was saying, you can create your own, you know, if you have photos from a trip that you took to Africa or something, and you want to you know, put a, a brief description of what you saw and did, you, know, you can create your own very simply. I just use mine uh, with PowerPoint. And then I recorded the slideshow and then I saved it as a MP4. I mean, it's simple as can be. As far as audio goes, I, I really love to use music because music can convey a lot about a culture that you can't say so much in words. So we always bring um, music to listen to. Usually I put on the music as we're setting up so that as people come in, they're listening to the music kind of sets the mood for where we're traveling that day. And I have used some audio. Uh, for example, we did one on um, Antarctica and I found a really interesting NPR interview uh, where he was interviewing some people that had lived and worked there. So we, I did a, a little bit of that uh, for listening as part of, because uh, there aren't any folk tales from Antarctica. So that was uh, what we used for in place of that piece of the puzzle. And um, just to ask a little bit more about the programming, is it a program you offer year round or is it, um, monthly and and do you see the the same um, folks coming through on a regular basis? Like, kind of how long do you see um, patrons, you know, continuing with a program? We offer ours uh, once a month, and they are uh, all uh, in care facilities. And uh, we have maybe fifteen that we kind of rotate through. But really, it doesn't matter if you do the same one every January because you're gonna, chances are really good that you're gonna have a different group and that the people in the group will be at a different stage in the process of their disease. So although it does seem a little bit repetitious to us, we, we kind of you know, have a few things that we change out, but we uh, really wanted to design programs, a set of them that you can grab and go off the shelf so that we're not reinventing the wheel every time. And it really doesn't seem to be a problem to do the same program every January or every February because the groups that are there are changed so frequently. Thank you. Yeah, that's helpful to hear just from a, a even staffing and library. Yes, yes, Mary Beth. One more thing about um, memory cafes. It's really hard to start one necessarily, especially as a library as a, one institution and to spread the word about that. So if you do have a dementia um, friendly area in your, in your town, community in your town, um, you can overlap with them. And also that percolator network um, in Massachusetts is a tremendous resource and they can answer a lot more questions about the specific specifics of starting a program mm -hmm. um, than I can, but. I second that they're outstanding, outstanding resource. So let's see who we can get. Yeah, that'd be great if uh, you wanna pop that in the, That's the in chat. The, if, you, if you get the handout, it will be one of the links. Perfectly. Oh, wonderful. And that'll be sent out to all the participants yeah. um, afterwards. Wonderful. 
Um, and we had one follow-up question from Kelsey in terms of just the, the exact language when, when marketing. Um, she asked on the flyers, for example, do you say, quote, for persons with dementia, or do you keep that off? I mean, do you go right at it or, or? All right. So as a caregiver of someone with dementia, I'm not afraid of that word whatsoever. Um, and most people are not, you know, when you're living with it, you don't care what it's called. Um, um, and I think the dementia friendly America approach is that, you know, call it what it is. And because it's so encompassing too, you can't say Alzheimer's is not the same as FTD, it's not the same as vascular, it's not the same as Lewy bodies. So, you know, if you if you only want to you know couch it in memory terms, that's that's wouldn't have included my husband's disease, because his was more language um, parts of the brain. The speaking and, and reading and writing were all affected in him. Um, so, yeah, I don't think people are afraid of it anymore. Um, those who are living, what do you think, Tammy? Uh, we only do programs off site currently. We haven't actually done any at the library. So I, but I do think that it would be important to mention that so that you would know whether or not it's appropriate for you. You know, you don't want to go to a program that's for a group that you don't belong to. So I think it would be totally appropriate and necessary to, as part of the explanation of what it is. Yeah. There are some sites that talk about, you know, appropriate language too, because you're supposed to use the phrase and it's kind of cumbersome, people living with dementia. You know, we say that over and over and over, but you don't just say people with dementia or, or people diagnosed with dementia. It's, it's kind of like, this is something that they're living with. It's not, you know, it doesn't um, define them. Um, it's just part of their condition. So. Thank you that just for sharing your own personal reflections as well as experience. That's, that's really helpful. Um, and uh, Michelle had asked about uh, putting the YouTube link in the chat. Um, Michelle, I'm not sure if the one you're referring to is the one that Mary Beth talked about where she did the readings. Is that, um, if you can clarify, I think that's the one that she's referring to. Those, those are also in the handout. Um, oh, fantastic. There yeah. you go. Uh, <laughs> Michelle, you'll get those links uh, with the handout. Um, and anything else that you would like to share, Mary Beth and Tammy, before we sign off here? I would just like to say that this is such a, a program where I feel more blessed than um, you know, people, the people who are participating. It's just, I, I get more than I give, you know, so um, it's, it's, they're, they're really so receptive and happy and, and anxious to have contact with other human beings that they're just, they're really a pleasure to work with. I found that to be the case too. It's a very, very feel good kind of thing. Yes, there are a few challenges, but the benefits so outweigh the cost. And like she said, they, they don't even care what you're talking about. That just the fact that you come is um, especially now with COVID and having been locked behind closed doors all these months, they're just anxious to have other in-person, face-to-face -face contact with other human beings. And it goes a long, long way to uh, relieving anxiety and loneliness and depression and all those things that can make the symptoms of the disease worse. So it's very, very rewarding group to work with. Very, very, um, a lot of fun, actually. We're just trying to make their day better, you know? Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's about quality of life. Yeah. Enhancing quality of life. And that's why we don't worry that they even remember what we talked about last time. But they do remember how they felt when you were there. So they may not remember that you talked about Italy, but they remember, oh, that lady, we had fun with her. <laughs> and so, yeah. Oh, that is so wonderful. Um, what a nice uh, way to end this session. Thank you very much to everyone attending today. Thank you very much, Mary Beth and Tammy for sharing uh, your experiences and um, for touching the lives that you touch and helping others connect as well in their communities. You will Thank receive, you. Um, yes, very much. Um, you will receive an email with a link to the recordings for this webinar and have a wonderful day.